Hello, welcome. Uh, it's projected. So I'm going to take you guys back to 1983. Seven years before I started my business of design on the west side of Los Angeles. And the phone rings. My assistant answers it, buzzes me, and says, Saul Bass is on the phone for you. I go, yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so with a kind of a smirk and sarcasm, I instantly said, hi, Saul. How are you? <laughs> and Saul, not knowing, Hold oh, Stan, this is Saul Bass. And I said, oh my God, this is like a cross between Barry White and Walter Cronkite. <laughs> but it sounded kind of legit. I mean, who would be impersonating me? I'm kind of a prankster myself, so I had a lot of designer friends who would pull the wool over my eyes. So this is their way of getting back, kind of a backhanded way. Stan, I know you've been a member of AIGA for the mid-70s. And you know, we're now going from national into local chapters, and I was wondering if you would be so kind to join the local membership of Los Angeles. Oh my God, this was Saul Bass <laughs> calling me personally. I was floored that my design god, the one that I admired for so many years, was calling me personally. I was really taken aback. <laughs> so now at age 16, this is my hometown of Sacramento. I went to the Crest Movie Theater. I had no idea who Saul Bass was. I was there impatiently waiting for the 1966 blockbuster Grand Prix. And all I knew about Grand Prix was about Formula One cars and starred James Garner and Eva Marie Saint. And, uh, but all of a sudden, the red velvet curtains opened. And it was a line that said, black, white type out of a black field, a John Frankenheimer film. It then had the most amazing images that just floored me. this amazing title sequence that I got familiar for the first time at age 16 with Saul Bass. This movie went on to win three Academy Awards for their technical excellence, but I was so impressed with the title sequence. It was just phenomenal. It stayed with me, and I had no idea at that time of my life how much Saul Bass was already involved in my life. For instance, I would be at the kitchen table enjoying my Quaker Oats cereal. I didn't know why my parents were attracted to buying this, this tall box that had this Quaker man. Was it the Quaker man with the rosy cheeks and the blue hat and the blue coat that really attracted them? 
Well, Saul Bass was there. This is a corporate logo he did for Quaker. When I went to college, I started filling out my own, uh, sending them off my own bills for receipts. And, and so Bell System was the first one that I, no problem. <laughs> and I was all of a sudden aware of the graphic treatment of the Bell System be, be, long before I was a designer. And when they diversified and divested, it became AT&T. And then all of a sudden, the globe was there. Saul Bass was here again. When I'd hop on a United flight, or I'd take Continental Airlines, or I'd fly in Frontier, Saul Bass was there. And I'd go to the bank. I'd blow my nose. <laughs> I'd drink out of a Dixie cup. Or buy Girl Scout cookies. Saul Bass was there. I'd season my steak with some Lowry's seasoning. I'd put some Wesson oil in the pan. Or I'd wrap my leftovers with aluminum foil. Saul Bass was there. I'd take pictures with my Minolta camera. Go to a Warner Brothers movie. I'd give a donation to United Way or go to the Getty. Saul Bass has been in my life and your life forever. So how did this man become this legend that we so know of? So many people, lay people, know of, of Saul Bass or at least been indirectly or directly affected by his work. Interesting things happen when the creative impulse is cultivated with curiosity, freedom, and intensity. Saul was curious from the get-go. He loved sports. He was an avid reader, especially science fiction. He studied archaeology. The more ancient, the better. He was born in May 20th, 1920, in the East Bronx of New York City. He was born the second child of a Jewish immigrants from Eastern Europe. And as Saul said, he was born on the other side of the tracks. But one thing he had was he had a close-knit family that really supported his artistic talents. This was really destiny for Saul. He was going to have greatness through this. In high school, he won the School Art League of New York City in high school. These were major prestigious awards. And I don't know if anybody knows who John Wanamaker is, but he was like the godfather of advertising and a pioneer in marketing. He won the John, John Wanamaker annual drawing competition at age 17. He was a star early on. At 16, he worked at Buckhoff's, Bucknoff's Deli as a delivery boy. And also, he was doing hand-painted signs for some of the fruit stalls as well as some of the store signs. Lucky for him, there was a scout from the Art Student League of New York that spotted him and spotted his artistic signs and said, we're going to give you a scholarship. So what happened for him, the depression was going on at that time. We're talking about the mid-30s. Saul's family would have loved for him to go to college, but that's the last thing that they could afford. They really needed him to help supplement the income for the family. So he was going to school one night a week on the scholarship for six months. And he ended up, this is the Arts Student League in New York, and it was a class called Layout and Design for Industry. And his just, it just blossomed from there. One of his mentors was Howard Trafton, and Howard was a successful commercial artist in illustration and topography and lettering. And he really trained Saul to understand color and composition and the whole difference between, that well, there really wasn't a big difference in his opinion, between painting and drawing and then design and advertising. Howard Trafton was influenced by European modernism. 
in a 1986 interview with educator and teacher Archie Boston, Saul Bass conveys to a lot of students how important it is in this time even to learn how to draw. He says, yeah, you can get a job without that skill, but you're always kind of going to be dancing around it. The ability to be able to draw gives you that extra thing that you need today, even though everything's high tech and so fast. I can't believe that I'm calling Saul Bass a paste-up guy, but he was doing lettering. He was a paste-up man for Warner Brothers in New York. Then he got upgraded to 20th Century Fox in New York as a layout man. But he was very frustrated with this industry because all the executives were making the decisions of where the art should go. He called it the potpourri of art. And these are just three examples. It's just like you see a section of this and you say, fill it up. I mean, maybe you would think these are pretty vintage posters and you'd like to have them on your wall, but Saul was very frustrated with that. <laughs> he then went to an agency called Blaine Thompson, where he made a stipulation. He, he took a 50% pay cut to go here, but he had a stipulation. If he's going to go here, he doesn't want to work on any more movie advertising anymore. <laughs> Well, lucky for him, at Blaine Thompson, he met Jorge Kipchi, who was the Hungarian-born author, designer, teacher of the language of vision. He also taught at the Chicago Bauhaus, New Bauhaus of Chicago, as well as then he now was teaching at Brooklyn College, while well, Saul finally got his chance to enroll in college and started taking courses from him. Yorgi really helped him understand the whole idea of design and look at it totally different than he ever had before. He helped him transition from a person that was really talented and passionate about modernistic design to becoming a major player, as Saul has. Yorgi talked about visual tension as the getting the combination of visual elements together that really form the essence of the universal language of vision. In 1946, Saul was offered a job in Hollywood. He left to become an ad man and a pitch man for, in Hollywood. One thing he found out really quickly <laughs> is that all the time that he had in New York, working with those tough people in New York, well, he was, as he says, you don't know how wrong I was about that, being that it was really difficult in Hollywood. But what was really great for him is he had the opportunity to now fight for something if he had to, through all that training. In 1952, he not only persevered, but he flourished. It was amazing what he did. He went out on his own in 1952, and he was really becoming really a unique, highly specified graphic designer, well sought out. He started getting his own style, very bold, with great symbolism, and a narrative that had emotional content. For instance, like the man with the golden arm, St. Joan, Anatomy of a Murder, Vertigo, Exodus, just to name a few. In 1956, Elaine McTura, who was working at Capitol Records as a designer, walked in and got hired at Saul's office. Now, Elaine was very serene and soft-spoken and loved to be out of the public eye, whereas Saul was bold and gregarious. Well, in 1961, they got married. In 1964, their daughter Jennifer was born. In 67, Jeffrey was born. And over many decades, together, they consulted together on creating film titles for 
dozens and dozens of Hollywood films. Going back to 1954, how does a graphic designer all of a sudden become doing film titles? Well, Otto Preminger gave him the opportunity, which was amazing, on the first one called Carmen Jones. He had, this is Viennese man, had a really quite a temperament. He was known as Otto the Terrible. <laughs> and through this, believe it or not, all these challenges for 13 different titles he did from 1954 to 1979 with Otto. And he said some, sometimes they'd have a battle so bad that both people would be killed and then they'd come back alive and do the rest of the adver advertising campaign. This is Carmen Jones, the first title sequence that he did. You know, I don't know, and I don't know if this is question and answer time right now. So we went ahead and Premier Primager and Kramer and Hitchcock and Wilder and Krubik and Scorsese were all the different ones, just to name a few, that he did title treatments for. One of his great goals was reach for a simple visual phrase, just cracking the door open slightly to give a hint of what that movie's gonna be all about, which really evokes the essence of the story. Through this art form that he was introducing to moviegoers, it was a new genre that he created. It really, truly, in his words, set the mood for the film that they were gonna see. You're all familiar with possibly it's a mad, 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 mad world. He did these crazy <clears throat> loony graphics that really complimented how loony slapstick this film was. And of course, Anatomy of a Murder, all black and white, with Duke Ellington's music. Body parts coming together on this title sequence. West Side Story. Because the credits were so long, they had an epilogue on the back end where they showed graffiti, and in the, in the graffiti, they actually have the credits that you could see, and Saul says that he, if you look closely, there's a heart, and it's got SB and EB, so <laughs> Elaine and Saul. Cape Fear was another one. Now, Elaine gave a great way, low-tech version of how to get this shot that was in the back of the parking lot of Saul Bass's office. They just poured water in a Pyrex dish and she used a hairdryer. <laughs> and of course, Casino was the last one he did in 1995. He passed away the next year. One thing over the years that he got to do, not only the advertising for people, but he also had the opportunity to be hired to storyboard, come up with certain scenes and depict them, and he got credit as the visual and pictorial consultant. Along with all the film titles they did, Elaine and Saul Bass became known for their short films, many of them. This one short film, Why Man Creates, is a 29-minute documentary that covers really the, the idea of creation, the nature of creation. It went on to win amazing amounts of awards, including an Academy Award in 1968. One of the other gods, and design gods, is Milton Glaser. And I love what he says here. I believe that there are very few artists in our time who have created as memorable a series of designs and objects Saul truly shaped the vision of our time. You all here in this theater, like I said, have been affected by his influence. So I'm talking about the importance of Saul today as well as it keeps on going. It's just amazing the influence of this man. You look at Mad Men and, and Falling Out and that really, that they even give credit to Saul coming up. In 1996, he passed away. And 15 years after that, Jennifer 
Bass, his daughter, designer, feverishly worked on this book, Saul Bass, A Life in Film and Design. She went through archive after archive, reel after reel, file after file, along with author and educator, Pat Curtan. I actually went to Sprouts and I put the book in one of the scales. To me, this represents how vast this man, this is the 423 page book, about 11 by 12 inches and seven pounds. <laughs> this truly is a remarkable man. And I just have to say, thank you, Saul Bass, for still influencing me as a designer. You're my hero.